Good afternoon. Yes, I know, it says this is the Sunday talk for April 16th, and yet it's not Sunday, April 16th. Well, for some reason, um, here at Unity of Greater Hartford, our live stream of that service um, stopped halfway through the Sunday talk. I'm Reverend Christine Boylan, the minister here at Unity of Greater Hartford, and um, we are researching and investigating why that happened. But in the meantime, we wanted to share the Sunday talk with you in full. So I am here on Tuesday and recording this, um, uh, the Sunday talk called Now What? And somehow it's just perfect that on that Sunday, the live stream stopped and we all got to say, now what? <laughs> so uh, I'm sorry for any confusion or uh, worry that may have caused some people. And hopefully um, you will take some time during the week to listen to Sunday's talk entitled, Now What? And so here we are. Here we are after Easter, after Jesus' resurrection, after our intention to resurrect. And now what? Where do we go from here? For Jesus, he has resurrected, but not yet ascended. He's still interacting with people on this physical plane, but, but now what? For the apostles, well, they experienced great trauma and grief and fear as they witnessed Jesus being arrested, put on trial, and then executed. And then more trauma as they hid out in fear, wondering if they were next, since they were certainly seen as the leaders in this Jesus movement. And then from grief to complete confusion, as they realized as Jesus had resurrected, and then experienced two visits from Jesus. But now what? I think we can all relate to that phrase of exasperation when we throw up our hands and look to the sky and say, now what? <laughs> I'm sure all of us have had that experience. Well, I want to share with you one of my now what stories. Yes, I have more than one. I'm certain you do too. Well, in order to get here, to get to Unity of Greater Hartford, as your minister, I had lots of obstacles to get around, lots of challenges to overcome, and lots of waiting without knowing, being in that in-between time. Lots of, now what? And just when I thought all was smooth sailing, um, I had been hired, the contract was signed, uh, the movers were, were in order, I was packing everything up in Missouri, and then I got a phone call. A phone call from the moving company. Hmm. All right, I answered the phone, and they explained to me that things happened, and they were unable to keep their commitment to move all of my stuff out to Connecticut. What? Huh? Oh my goodness, my heart was pounding. I could barely breathe. I couldn't understand. I said, but we have an agreement. They couldn't do it. Oh my goodness, I hung up from them and said, now what? Now what? <sighs> what to do next? Now what? It's hard to keep in a place uh, uh, of faith and not go to fear. Hard to not think, oh, maybe the universe is telling me I shouldn't go to Connecticut. Uh, maybe I really can't do this minister stuff. Yeah, hard not to, to go there. For now what? Well, obviously everything worked out. Me and all my belongings arrived a week before I was to begin as the new minister here. And how did it get resolved? Well, certainly not by staying in fear and being closed down and whining, now what? Eventually, eventually, by jumping into faith, insisting that there had to be a better idea or a better way to get me and all my stuff to Connecticut. Somehow, in faith, going from now what to, oh, what now? Yeah, yet thinking back on that experience, didn't happen like a snap of the finger. Mm -mm. 
So I can relate to the puzzles, fearful exasperation of perhaps saying, now what? Let's look at the Gospel of John, chapter two, verses one through 14. And it begins oddly, it begins with afterwards, meaning after Jesus resurrected and had visited the apostles. Jesus appeared to the apostles again, this time by the Sea of Galilee. It happened this way. Peter, Thomas, Bartholomew, James and John, and two other apostles. They don't say their names. I'm thinking one most surely was Andrew, because that's the brother of Peter. They're never too far apart. Well, Peter says to them, I'm going out fishing. And they all say, well, we'll go with you. So they went out, got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore, but the apostles did not realize it was Jesus. Nevertheless, he called out to them saying, friends, haven't you caught any fish? No, they answered. And Jesus replied, throw your net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. When they did, they were unable to haul the net in because of the large number of fish. Then the disciple or apostle whom Jesus loved, meaning John, said to Peter, ah, it is the Lord. As soon as Peter heard him say that, he jumped into the water and went to Jesus. The other apostles followed in the boat, towing the net full of fish, for they were not far from shore. When they landed, they saw a fire uh, of burning coals with fish on it and also some bread. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish you have just caught. So be Peter climbed back into the boat and dragged the net ashore as it was full of large fish. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. None of the apostles dared ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came, took the bread and gave it to them and did the same with the fish. is that a lovely story? Jesus being uh, so taking care of these apostles, calling them friends. Yeah. Well, let's take a look at the story metaphysically and then we'll look at it through the lens of now what? Jesus. Metaphysically, Jesus represents our Christ self our potential perfection, desiring to be expressed and always there for us as us, the apostles. Well, Peter represents faith. Thomas is spiritual intelligence or insight. Bartholomew is imagination. James represents wisdom or discernment, even um, even intuition. John, of course, is love. Andrew, who I'm pretty sure was there as the unnamed one, is strength. And then what's the other one? Well, I'm thinking it had to be Philip, which is power. And as we go on, you may agree too. Fish. Fish represent divine ideas in which there is a great possibility of increase. Watch goldfish. They increase. Jesus used fish ideas to represent the inexhaustible, everywhere present abundance. And eating fish is about recognizing and using divine ideas. So you first catch the fish, you recognize the divine ideas, and then you can eat the fish or use divine ideas. The sea, well, the sea signifies universal mind or God mind. It's that great realm of unexpressed and unformed thoughts and ideas that contain all potentiality. And where are they? They're right inside of you. Night, uh, it's about totally being in our human understanding where we think we need to work long and hard, but with little gain. It's all about being in the struggle and the net. The net metaphysically represents our mind that catches thoughts 
but still mostly on the basis of external conditions. The net also works long and hard in the darkness of human understanding and gains but little until it recognizes spiritual law, until it recognizes the Lord. Love recognizes spiritual law and then catches divine ideas, those fish. And I love how Jesus gives them this advice Throw the net on the other side, the right side, which metaphysically represents spiritual power. That's Philip. I love how, I also love how it doesn't occur to them where they're in this uh, fear fog. Ever been in that fog of fear? And the most obvious thing eludes you. Oh, oh, you mean there's another side of the boat? <laughs> yes. Um, so we take all this heady metaphysics and discover the meaning for us today. And that brings me to a quote by the American New Thought writer and teacher, Ernest Holmes. And he wrote, what would happen if we converted the energy of fear to faith, the energy of doubt to a feeling of belonging to the universe and being safe in it? Would not the original artist, which of course means God, go forth with us into a new creation? Yeah. Fear to faith. Now what to, oh, what now? So how did the apostles handle their now what situation? First they went into denial. Jesus? Who's Jesus? I don't, I don't think I know a Jesus. Mm -hmm. Ever done that? Deny. Then they went into fear, hiding out, thinking they may be next. And when the apostles stayed in fear, they went back to the old, what they knew before they met Jesus. They decided to go fishing. And that happens to us too, doesn't it? They decided to keep in fear, keep in the darkness of night, refuse to discern any new ideas, catch nothing, and then they get to declare themselves failures. Now what? When we're in fear, we too are in the darkness of that fear. It's all we can see. We can't be curious. We, we are not in faith. Our imagination is not working. We're not very wise. We don't have insight or intuition. We don't feel strong or powerful. All of that seems not to be available. Fear closes us down. We only see the left side of the boat. We're only aware of the small, limited physical and not the expansive spiritual potential. And then it's morning, a new day, a new light. And slowly we open our eyes, see a familiar figure, the Lord, spiritual law. And even though that person, that spiritual law isn't fully recognizable or understandable, they and us can choose to listen. We can let go of our tight grip on fear. And when we do, we're able to hear and see and be curious. Well, what an interesting idea. Throw our nets on the other side. Wow, lots and lots of fish, lots and lots of divine ideas. And when they do recognize Jesus, when they do, or when we recognize the Christ in ourselves, they enthusiastically greet the Christ and come to feast on all the divine ideas within. And they move from a fearful, exasperated, now what, to a faith-filled expectancy of, ooh, what now? And in our fully human self, we act like these apostles, even though, of course, we have the capacity to express and live the Christ, no matter what's happening in this ever-changing physical world. 
that Christ is always available to us as us. Those powers, those 12 spiritual powers are always available to us as us. We are always one with the divine. So when the moving company canceled, I wish I had moved immediately within, prayed and became open to divine ideas. It would have been a lot easier, but no. Mm -mm. I too spent some time in fear, went back to old worn habits of worry and fretting. And it wasn't until the dawn of a new morning when I had a new thought that a solution came about. When I chose to be in faith, curious and open to divine ideas. So how about you? How quickly can you move from a fearful, now what, to a faith-filled, ooh, what now? Let's take a moment and follow in Jesus' footsteps. What did Jesus do during this in-between the resurrection and ascension time? Did he go back to being a carpenter? Did he hide out? Did he spend time worrying about the ascension? I, I started wondering if I were him. You know, um, perhaps I would have been spending my time making sure I was ready for the perfect ascension. Oh yes, lots of planning to do. I would have spent time deciding what hill or mountain I was going to use for my ascension. And um, what would I wear? Would I be barefoot? Or would I wear sandals? Um, and what would I say before the ascension? I mean, that talk would have to be a really good talk. Yeah. I don't think Jesus did any of that. Mm -mm. No. Instead, he most likely prayed, spent time in the silence, discerning how he could best be of service to himself and to others during this in between time. So let's review what he did do. First, he didn't hide out. Mm -mm. He showed himself to the women who came to take care of him in the tomb, as well as his apostles. He continued to teach, to reassure, to comfort. He then went about being a servant leader, taking care of his apostles or his friends. In this story, he started a fire where he cooked them fish and bread and made sure they received what they needed. He did not spend time in now what, but with a deep faith and a deep commitment to his spiritual journey, he served during this time of in-between or this time of now what. What did it occur to you in a now what time? to choose to be in faith, knowing that all is well. And instead of staying in fear, move to be of service. To first go within to see with your spiritual eyes. So when you opened your physical eyes, you remained unaware and a willing conduit for your Christ potential. You look to see how you could be of service, could discern what was yours to do, and as you did that, excitedly say, oh, what now? You see, the apostles were not the only ones experiencing grief, loss, and trauma. There were many, many disciples or followers of Jesus. Who was comforting them? Who was teaching them? Who was serving them? They too were in that now what or in between fearful time. And being in that in between time can be very scary. Often there is nothing we can do to organize an unknown future. Believe me, I've tried. No, it will remain unknown until that future becomes the present. And sometimes the future we force into a fearful vision doesn't ever become a reality. We just spend lots of useless time in worry and fear exclaiming, now what? And we have many in-between times in our lives that, that 
maybe aren't necessarily scary, but there's still that now what in between time. Perhaps a time when our body is sick and healing, but we're not totally recovered and well. The time in between jobs, in between working and retirement. These times might not be scary, but they may still involve worry, fretting, and even resistance. What would our present time, a step especially an in-between time, be like if we let go of our fearful grip on the future and chose today to fly in faith? What would it be like if instead of now what, it became an ooh, what now? This week, choose to truly walk in Jesus' footsteps. Choose to throw your net on the other side of the boat, the side of faith and prayer. Choose to feast on divine ideas and with all of your spiritual powers, throw up your hands, look to the sky and say, ooh, what now? Enjoy it all. Namaste.